A material's specific heat capacity is how much energy in joules is required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of it by one degree Kelvin or centigrade. For water it's 4.2 kilojoules and for ethanol it's 2.46 kilojoules. So to raise one kilogram of water from zero to 100 degrees centigrade requires 420 kilojoules. That would take a one kilowatt heater 420 seconds or seven minutes. Specific latent heat of vaporization is less intuitive. It is the amount of energy required to change one kilogram of liquid to vapor, but without changing its temperature. For one kilogram of water at 100 degrees centigrade, it takes 2.26 megajoules to turn it into water vapour. That is 2,260 seconds or 37 minutes 40 seconds with a one kilowatt heater. Ethanol boils at a lower temperature than water at around 78 degrees centigrade and has a specific latent heat of vaporisation of 838 kilojoules per kilogram, so a lot lower than water. Here is the familiar phase diagram of water ethanol mixtures. The lower curve shows the boiling point of the liquid mixture and the upper curve is the proportion of ethanol and water that boils off from that mixture. So we can see that a 10% of ethanol in water mixture boils at about 90.5 degrees centigrade and the mixture of vapours that comes off it is about 60% ethanol and 40% water. If we condense that vapour mixture we get a liquid of 60% ethanol, 40% water, and if we boil that liquid, we get vapour that is about 82% ethanol. Repeating that process gets us ever closer to the azeotropic point of 95.63% ethanol by mass, or 96.51% by volume. Another way of displaying these data is to use the McCabe-Thiele type plot shown here, where the alcohol proportion in the liquid phase is shown as a straight line and the corresponding alcohol proportion in the vapour phase is shown as the curve. We can now add in the same fractional distillation steps. This plot shows an equilibrium state with no distillate drawn off the column. This equates to what's called 100% reflux. As soon as we start drawing spirit off the column, these points will change from equilibrium to steady state. The advantage of the McCabe-Thiele plot is that this can be modelled easily by drawing another straight line here, representing the degree of reflux that is less than 100%. While it does produce product, the number of stages now necessary to get to the same concentration is increased. This plot enables us to calculate the cooling needed at each stage based on what we know about the vapour flowing into the stage from below and out above, and the liquid flowing into the stage from above and out below. This histogram shows the cooling required from the first few stages of a distillation column with different concentrations of alcohol in the wash. These are not the same power settings, therefore the same alcohol vapour flow rate. Distillation columns are made to operate over a specific range of vapour flow rates. To distill an azeotropic ethanol water mixture will require a column with 20 or so effective stages, and at least 15 of these are operating in the range between about 94 and 96.5% ethanol by volume. The column is designed to optimise performance in those 15 or so stages, and to do that the vapour coming into them needs to have a fairly constant ethanol vapour flow rate. To achieve this, the total power required for a 1% wash concentration is a lot more than it is at 15%, and this shows where the power goes. Almost all of it is dissipated in the first three stages, and most in the first stage. And almost all is to condense water vapour. Returning to this graph, you can see that by stage three you're at about 90% alcohol. The remaining 18 odd stages needed to get to the azeotrope at 96.51% by volume are in effect adiabatic, which means they do not exchange any heat with their surroundings. How to design for this differs for batch versus continuous distillation. I'll discuss batch distillation first as it is the process I started with and is the most familiar to home distillers. If you are new to distillation and you do not yet have a still, I suggest going straight to a continuous process if vodka is your goal, because it has several advantages, including potentially lower cost. I'll return to that in later videos. 
With batch distillation, as the batch progresses, the alcohol content of the liquid in the boiler falls, and as it does so, maintaining a constant alcohol vapour flow rate requires increasing the boiler power. That's quite easy to do. You simply use a powerful heater and a controller that allows the power to be varied over a wide range. But all that heat is going to be released from vapour when it condenses, and that occurs in the distillation column. That need for varying heater power does not arise in continuous distillation because the wash concentration is constant. Another advantage of continuous distillation is that you have a choice of whether to add wash to the column as vapour or a liquid, whereas in batch distillation it has to be added as vapour. And this choice turns out to be consequential. Returning back to this diagram of heat loss per stage, you can see that the higher stages are adiabatic, whereas the lower stages are highly exothermic because they require heat loss to the surroundings. Between these two is what I will call the adiabatic transition zone. As a batch distillation run progresses, the alcohol content in the boiler falls and the heating power increases. This means that the cooling requirement of the column bottom rises and the adiabatic transition zone will go higher and higher up the column because the position of the first three stages is not being determined by the length of the column but by the speed at which heat can be lost from those first two or three stages. More heat loss means more column length so the adiabatic section of the column where our azeotropic process occurs gets shorter and shorter until it's too short to allow enough effective stages to get to the azeotropic point. To fix this, we've got to do something else to cool the column. Quite often, that is adding a column head condenser. There are many videos on YouTube about doing this, and if you look at those, you will see two things. Firstly, they never get to the azeotropic point of 96.5%. They usually get somewhere between 93 and 95 and the difference between 95 and 96.5 is hard to get, but worth doing. The other thing you'll notice is that many of these videos use tray columns, either sieve trays or bubble cap trays, and either sight glasses or a glass tube column so that you can see on the video what's happening inside. And what you'll see is that the bottom one to three trays are often dry. That's because they're too hot. And they're too hot because it's at the bottom where the heat needs to be removed most quickly, and their column top condenser system simply doesn't achieve that. Not only that, but it requires the adjustment of two parameters. The power of the boiler heater and the flow rate of cooling water through the column head condenser. And it's far more difficult to juggle two parameters to find the column's optimal operating point than it is to adjust only one. In the next video I will explain how to solve these problems of column cooling for batch distillation.